Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Eastwood's Presbyterian Church. We're just so excited to have you here in the sanctuary. Those who will be online later this afternoon, we're grateful for you as well. We are a congregation committed to celebrating Jesus and connecting with and caring for all people. This morning, we want to, to uh, note your bulletin. There's some announcements in there. We ask each one to, to tear off this sheet and fill in your name and pass it to the ushers when it, the plates go by. But if you have a prayer request this morning that you would like included in the prayers of the people, please fill that out right now, and the ushers will collect it during the first song so I can weave it in to the prayer. It is my privilege this morning to welcome a friend, the Reverend Dr. Handy, with us this morning, Chauncey. We met in Washington, D.C., and I had the privilege of being at his wedding when he married one of my colleagues, Kate. And also, I was at your ordination on a, seemed like a dark, stormy night. Up at, made my way up to Maryland, and yeah. September 19th. What year? 2019. So uh, it's wonderful to have a colleague in the area and you, I think you'll enjoy all of our time together today as we share in the preached word and also as Chauncey leads a class right after worship in the meeting room. You're welcome to join us. We'll be dealing with those difficult, violent texts in the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, and there are a lot of those. So please plan to join us. It'll be a fascinating time, I promise you. Next Sunday, we'll have an all-church picnic. After worship, we'll gather outside and enjoy a barbecue. The church is providing the meat, but we're asking that you provide the uh, salads and the fruits and the desserts. So there is a sign-up sheet that has been provided out on the center table in what we call the narthex, and we hope that you'll sign up and plan to be a part of it. On Friday night, we went into the woods, um, our fire pit, and we had guests come. And uh, so we had a nice group of about 28, 30 people here roasting mar marshmallows and singing camp songs and, and just making new friends. So that is a wonderful um, a program that our Discipleship Commission is sponsor Committee is sponsoring. And then yesterday, we were downtown Vancouver with Unity Family Church for outdoor worship. And there were three Pentecostal churches represented and we Presbyterians. And we try to do our best. <laughs> so I want to thank Cynthia and Steve and Kay and Rhonda and Dale and April and Toby and my daughter Leah and Allison and Isabel for representing us and really being totally present, meeting lots of new people and sharing in song. It was a wonderful opportunity to share in the witness to Christ. So let us then continue to prepare our hearts as we claim Christ, the light of the world, at the center of our lives. Please stand as you are able for the call to worship. We come to worship, sometimes more like David and sometimes more like Goliath. We come to worship, to remember to trust in your strength, not our own, and to live into the calling you have on our lives. We come to worship to lay all that we are and all that we have before you. So let us worship God together. Good morning, church family. Um, this song that we're going to sing, this hymn, Be Thou My Vision, I've just learned from our incredible percussionist um, that it's one of the oldest known hymns from the 1400s. It's a traditional Irish tune. Um, so we're going to try to do justice to it um, 
I love your prayers, I love your support, but most of all, I love your voices and your spirit. Okay. I invite you to join with me in the greeting our friend Brian Cracker used to use before each service. God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. Our God is awesome. He is always doing something amazing. However, many times we cannot even explain or fully understand what God is doing in the world around us. So pray with me. <clears throat> All loving and forgiving God, often the scope of your forgiveness is beyond what our human minds can comprehend. And for this, we give you our greatest thanksgiving. Too often we, we do not fully understand or follow the true meanings of the great lessons you teach us through the stories of your miracles we read in Holy Scripture. Every day there are opportunities for us to be part of a miracle. Forgive us when we fail to look for those who might need the miracle of prayer and the sharing of your love. People all around us need your miracles. Lead us to missions and ministries that fully change lives. Help us to keep our thoughts and actions focused on serving others for you. Forgive us when we act in ways that make it look like we are running the world all by ourselves. Help us to see that is your job. Forgive us when we disappoint you and then open our hearts to the leading of your Holy Spirit. May you truly be thou our vision, O ruler of all. Accept now our silent prayers of confession.
Amen. Friends, if any person is in Christ, they are a new creation. Behold, the past is finished and gone. All is fresh and new. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And as God washes us and makes us clean, so too we practice forgiving one another and living in the peace of Christ that passes all understanding. So I invite you to greet one another, saying, may the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. I highlighted the wrong words. I highlighted the wrong words. Completely wrong words. I tried so hard.
we continue in prayer. Holy, loving God, you know the order of each universe. You see the details of new suns bursting out of black holes. You know the order of the seasons, the language of every people, race, and nation. And you understand us. Continue to reveal yourself, for we barely grasp the glory and power of your presence. On this day, we praise you for the gift of summer for the relationships that we celebrate that bring us so much joy and the ones that challenge us. Hear our prayers this morning as a people as we name out loud and in our hearts those people and situations that mean so much to us. We name them before you. On this morning, we join Sandy Rundell in praying for family friends who have a three-year-old son, River, who has type 1 diabetes. Oh, Lord, in your mercy, be with this family as they prepare a life plan for treatment and care. We join Maria and Brianna Henry this morning in remembering Maria's sister, Rose Picardo, who died one year ago today, entered your perfect presence, O oh Lord. So we join them in praying for peace and healing for the family. We hold the Engel family before you as Jim passed to be with you on Friday, my husband Dave's best friend. We hold before you, O oh God, those who are victims of violence, those who carry scars from long ago, and those who live in fear this very day. We pray for the police and the sheriffs in Clark County, in Vancouver, Camas, and Washougal, Brush Prairie, and Battleground, who are on duty this very morning and responding to calls to those in need. Protect each one. We pray for those in active military service. Give them a passion for peace as they serve our nation. Pour out wisdom on all who lead us in our community, nation, and world. Especially we pray for our president, governor, and mayor. Give them a heart for all of us. We observe that power can corrupt it can bring threats, but it can also be a blessing. And we claim blessings for those in prison, for those in tents, for children who are left alone while parents go to work this summer. We pray blessing for the immigrant and the widow. And we do this in the name of the one who became one of us and taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We do celebrate the one who came to live with us and pour out his life for us, even on a cross, and called us and gifted us to share the gifts that we have. So I invite the ushers to receive the morning offering as we ponder the gifts we have to share as a people of God.
Gracious God, we offer these, the gifts, the labors of our hands to you. Use them to bless others and to bring peace and joy and love in this land. We claim this because we follow your son, Jesus the Christ. Amen and amen. privilege to invite a Dr. Handy to read the scripture from the Hebrew scriptures this morning for us. It is wonderful to have a colleague in the area that is tenured. Well, on tenure track at least. On tenure track. On tenure track. In theory, it'll give me a permanent job. In theory. Yeah. Well, no, in practice, but it'll take six years. Six years. Okay. But anyhow, it's always nice to have um, good, thoughtful colleagues and theologians to ponder scripture together with. Because we as Presbyterians love the academy, but we like it to make sense right here and now. <laughs> so, reasonable. Hebrew scriptures. Yeah, uh, and now reading from 1 Samuel. Uh, now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. They were gathered at Sukkot, which belongs to Judah, in the camp between Sukkot and Azekah in the Ephes Damim. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armored with a coat of mail. The weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. He had greaves of bronze on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield-bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are not you servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, Today I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man that we may fight together. 
When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Allah fighting with the Philistines. David rose early in the morning, left someone in charge of the sheep, took the provisions, and went to Jesse as commanded him. He came to the encampment of the army that was going forth to the battle line, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. David left the things in the charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went to greet his brothers. As he talked with them, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before, and David heard him. David said to Saul, let no one's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight him, for you're just a boy, and he's been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. Whenever a lion or bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, The Lord, who saved me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword over the armor, and then he tried in vain to walk, for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I am not used to them. So David removed them. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in his shepherd's bag in the pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistines came on and drew near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come out to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine drew near to meet David, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, and slung it, and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The gospel. Chapter 22, starting at verse 47. While Jesus was still speaking, suddenly a crowd came, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, is this with, is it with a kiss that you are betraying the son of man? And when those who were around him saw what was coming, they asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? Then one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple police and the elders who had come for him. Have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a bandit? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is the hour and the power of darkness. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. In our Hebrew scriptures this morning, David exhibits a type of leadership that will lead him on a trajectory to violence. In 15 years' time, he will be anointed king in Hebron. 
He will reign there, we read in 2 Samuel, for seven years, and then he will move to Jerusalem. That will be his headquarters, if you will, and he will reign for, a, for 33 more years. Many of us were told the story of David and Goliath when we were little people. How many of you heard that story when you were young? Yes, a lot of people in this room. We know that even some of you have picture books in your library of this story. We've read the lectionary portion of this story that's being read in churches that choose to use the lectionary across the nation and the world. And we don't want to see our children or even ourselves see the rest of the story that comes afterwards where David not only kills Goliath, but he makes sure he's dead and then he cuts off his head and carries it around with him for a period of time. A colleague of mine in New Jersey, his name was Dr. Bill Chapman, wrote a book about the Bible and he called it Blood on Every Page. And we sort of like to ignore those scriptures. And so, Chauncey, in just a few moments, I'm going to ask you about all this violence. And you're going to teach us a class about it today. Yeah, I sure am. So my, my work is focused on the book of Joshua. And this morning's gospel reading, we see the trajectory set for a new Joshua, Jesus. If you look at the Greek, the names are the same. Jesus and Joshua have the same name in both Hebrew and Greek. And so it is this same new Joshua in the garden, who is arrested, not leading a conquest, not you know, destroying the promised land and, and its peoples and then taking it for the Israelites, but rather being clapped in irons and led, to the, and led to the cross. Now, this trajectory of leadership is Jesus's trajectory. The new Joshua moves towards the cross. And we're going to unpack some of those elements of the story this morning. Mm -hmm. So this savior of the world seems to stand in blatant juxtaposition to the violent warrior David. God in Christ wages a cosmic battle in the death and resurrection. And so the question for us is what kind of leadership does God need from us today? And as we think about an historical leader, we'll look at the Reverend Richard Twiss, who was born June 11th, 1954, in South Dakota, on the, in the Lakota Nation, and died in Washington, D.C. on February 9th, 2013. He was a Native American educator. He was a pastor here in Vancouver for a number of years. He taught at the universities in our greater metropolitan area. And he was a member of the Sagangu Lakota Oyate. And he and his wife, Catherine, who is still alive today in Vancouver, co-founded an organization called Wikonye, the Waikoni International, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. So let's dig in. Will you please join us in prayer? Uh, Holy Spirit, be present in our midst and reveal yourself to us uh, in and through and possibly against the text that we are reading this morning. We pray this all in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we begin first looking at the gospel. In all the pictures I've seen of Gethsemane, um, or rather paintings, I have never seen the disciples of Jesus armed with spears and swords. So I'm interested, what do you think is going on in this story in the Gospel of Luke, Chauncey? Well, it's really interesting. In the passage, several verses before we start uh, our reading this morning from Luke, Jesus tells the disciples that if you don't have a cloak, sorry, if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and go and buy one. Shortly thereafter, the disciples say, well, we have, here we have two swords. And Jesus says, well, that's enough. Well, this is a strange perspective for somebody who, in theory, would be running a revolution, right? Two swords against the Roman army is not quite going to do it. However, two swords is enough to raise plausible attention to draw the Roman gaze. Two swords is enough to pretend to be a revolutionary. In other words, bringing swords into the garden is planting circumstantial evidence on Jesus' disciples' persons. It is meant to get him arrested. It is meant for him to be seen by the Romans as a revolutionary such that they would lead him to the cross. 
to be executed as one. But as Jesus watches them use their swords, he is not pleased with the use of violence. And as you heard, he heals this servant's ear. That's a wonderful image, isn't it, of him picking up an ear and healing it immediately. And then he reprimands all who are with him for using their swords and their spears for violence. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the early church takes on this perspective of nonviolence and somewhat of an unbroken chain, even until now. But especially prior to the fourth century, prior to Emperor Constantine, nonviolence was standard amongst Christian communities. So, for instance, we have the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 10 saying, we do not wage war according to the flesh, and by this he means we don't get weapons and kill people with them. Uh, in the second century, Justin Martyr describes the responsibilities of converts to Christianity in this way. We who were filled with war and mutual slaughter and every wickedness have each through the whole world changed our warlike weapons, our swords into plowshares and our spears into implements of tillage, and we cultivate piety, he said. So these are just two of the many and manifold examples of Christians rejecting violence as a part of their faith that start from Jesus and stretch all the way until now. Mm -hmm. But after Constantine, violence, inquisitions, manifest destiny seem to grant the nations, Christians, and all those who follow the Abrahamic tradition the right to use violence to further their causes, even to today. And I myself personally have always been very interested in communities that have chosen the nonviolent way, like the Amish, the Quakers, the Mennonites. They seem to be closer to the Jesus way, following the Ten Commandments and also the teachings of Jesus. Yeah, I mean, what you'll find is that Manifest Destiny and other interpretive traditions that affirm violence try to build on elements of the Hebrew Scriptures. For instance, Deuteronomy highlights the ways that ritual slaughter is required by Israel. They are to kill all of the inhabitants of the land. Uh, Joshua spells this out in detail, the goal being to kill everyone who is not an Israelite at the command of God. This is every man, woman, and child. Uh, David's battle with the Philistines embodies a similar sort of violence where the word for servant in our text is actually the word for enslaved person. So we're talking about violence that is going to cause an entire society to be enslaved. And I mean, slavery hasn't changed very much uh, since antiquity, so we can all guess at what that means. Um, however, at the same time as these stories taking place in the Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament, Jesus, the Jewish Messiah of Israel, rejects the idea of divinely ordained violence. He interprets the text for the sake of life, for the sake of the love of God, for all of creation. And yet, meanwhile, most contemporary Christian interpreters seem hell-bent, and I use the word entirely on purpose, on ignoring their crucified and exalted Lord and Savior on this point, siding with death instead of life. And at this story, this story of David, there is much violence. And as we read through 1 Samuel, there is a lot more violence to come. But we appreciate in this passage that David sets aside the armor that Saul wishes to provide for him and the implements of war, if you will, and chooses to draw us one smooth stone out of his bag, the tools of a shepherd, to protect his flock, to bring down this mighty Philistine, Goliath. And David clearly says that I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, and he stands in the strength and the spirit of the Lord to face his Goliath. Can't argue with that. Uh, but at the same time, in just a brief moment, David will pick up a sword. And soon the cries from the mouths of all the Israelites, in particular the women, will be, Saul has killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And this cry will be uttered many times. And scripture tells us of Saul's very emotional response to this. This leads Saul to try and kill David later in the story. And so I just wonder how the biblical author writing these uh, ideas in the text, how, how would they have thought about those acclamations? I have no idea. So let's ask them someday, <laughs> yeah, shall write we? Them a letter. when we get to heaven. <laughs> For the path of David's rise to power is strewn with violence and war and death. 
And although his reign is heralded as mighty throughout the ages, uh, it was blighted, as you know, by personal sin and broken relationships. David is the ultimate contradiction, the man after God's own heart who spends all of 1 Samuel exhibiting an ideal vision of faith quickly turns in 2 Samuel and 1 Kings to a murderer, an enabler of sexual violence and death among his children, and a godfather-esque patriarch telling Solomon in 1 Kings 1, and this is not in the text, but this is my read, don't let my enemies die with gray hair. And so we see that violence in David's life leads to more violence. And in fact, we know in our own society, violence leads to violence, abuse to abuse. It is a cycle of sinful behavior that hurts us all. And so how do we, as believers in this day and age, break the cycle, the patterns? I think we, we turn to Jesus who breaks the pattern. And so, and, and following on the example that we have of Christ, we look for others who break the pattern as well. So when I was in that, at, at, serving at National Presbyterian in Washington, D.C. with Chauncey's beloved wife, Kate, I had occasion in several circles to ask, so who is it out there that's thinking theologically from the Native American perspective, from the indigenous perspective? Who should we follow? And so several people in several settings told me the Reverend Dr. Richard Twiss. And I was astounded to learn that he had lived in Vancouver, Washington, where I had come from. And he had died in 2013 when I had just come to serve a Salmon Creek United Methodist here in Vancouver. But one of my uh, indigenous parishioners there knew him well. They were dear friends. Chris Lashley, you knew his sons, right? You went to school with Richard Twiss's sons. And it's amazing to me that he is really one of the leading, has been one of the leading theologians. And his vision was to serve as a bridge builder and consultant nationally and internationally to develop understanding, respect, and mutual appreciation for one another, especially among Native American First Nations people. He wrote a book, he wrote several books. The one I've been reading for this sermon was One Church, Many Tribes, Following Jesus the Way God Made You. He was born on the Lakota land and to his mother, a native indigenous person, but he entered sort of a world of violence and got sucked into drugs and alcohol and ended up in Hawaii, in Maui, uh, in the 70s. And he, in a drug stupor, he cried out to the creator and said, help me, I'm going to die if you don't help me. And in one of those amazing moments, the very spirit of God, Jesus came to him and said, I love you, Richard, I forgive you. And he, in that moment, met Jesus the Christ and was delivered of his addictions. He went on to become educated at Asbury Theological Seminary. He came to Vancouver here to be a pastor at a church on Andreessen. And he began to believe that native indigenous people across the globe could be the best evangelists for Christ at this time and at this age. And that is what he presents in this book. He talks about manifest destiny and the fact that in this part of the country, early uh, tribes like the Spokane and the Nez Perce and the Colville had learned of Jesus, were waiting for Jesus and knew, but when the traditional missionaries came, they set them aside and said that you do not really know Jesus. You need to cut your hair like us, dress like us, sing songs like us, and then you'll know Jesus. And Reverend Richard Twist said that was not helpful to our cause and really has reinter reinterpreted the ability for Christ to speak through native indigenous people. It is a wonderful story. And the We Know Nay International Foundation continues working, and they will hold a family camp at, um, 
at Aldersgate in Turner, Oregon, where some of us go for Emmaus community in the third week of July, and they will have a powwow uh, on, on July 28th. So the movement continues, and I'm eager to learn more. And I wanted to say that Richard died, um, Chauncey, he died because he'd gone from here out to D.C. to be a part of the National Prayer Breakfast. Wow. And while he was there, he had a massive heart attack. Mm. And his family all came, and the community surrounded him, and he died and went to be with the Lord. But his ministry and his vision carries on incredible story. I mean, it's, it's so interesting because I, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. I'm from Bellingham uh, up the road. Uh, but the, the realities of indigenous communities, uh, the tribes and the treaties is just something that I'm starting to learn about now. Uh, I know now that there were eight treaties signed by the settlers who came to occupy the land that were enacted by Governor Isaac Stevens of the territory of Washington. Uh, and he also was the one making sure that they were not kept as time went on. So this is a series of sad stories. You can see some of them here on the screen. So we've got the Treaty with the Yakima in 1855, followed by the Treaty with the Walla Walla, followed by the Treaty of Olympia, followed by the Treaty of Point No Point, and followed by the Treaty of Point Elliot, uh, and several others as, as it goes. Now, Joyce, I, I realize that you were an executive in this synod at one point, in the Pacific Northwest, mm -hmm. and your mother was also a pastor on the Puyallup Reservation in Tacoma, and that you've met many of these tribal leaders mm -hmm. through your connections. Yes, I did. And that's why I'm even more committed to Richard Twist and his vision of walking alongside the Native community and listening to how they interpret the gospel and following them into faithfulness in this time. It's interesting that we share an authority, the, a high view of the authority of Scripture in, in the Reformed tradition. Uh, however, I think often we fail to realize that the violent texts in Scripture do not grant us permission to further the ends of the church by resorting to violence. The authority of Scripture does not mean that every single passage should be reenacted in our lives exactly the way it is in the text. Now, if we're, if we're taking the scriptures in this sense, I think it might serve us better to consider the authority of the scripture in the same way that we do road signs. Now, bear with me. So, when you come to a stop sign, it seems to imply that here you'll need to pause before you go on to make sure the road is safe. When you come to a sign saying rocks ahead, you take caution and look out for falling stones. And when you come to a sign saying dead end, it means that you are not going to get anywhere on this particular road. If you have pretensions of driving further past this point, you won't get to where you're going. And so I think if we're able to reshape the way we look at texts as on this spectrum, some texts are indeed a dead end saying, please don't go down this way, <coughs> the book of Joshua. Uh, other texts are perhaps abiding with caution. Story of David, who knows? But I think this is, this is perhaps a way that we can reimagine our sense of authority of Scripture. Mm -hmm. So then, we do agree that when we meet Jesus in the garden, and he says, lay down your swords, as he heads to the cross for us. As we look at a David who sets aside the armor and takes one stone out of his pouch, that each of them were counting on God's redempting work to work in their lives at that time. And that's where we want to stand, and that's how we want to lead. Absolutely. But violence is always a choice. Mm -hmm. And so we need to discover together the Jesus way. So we want to reflect uh, together just briefly as we close this sermon on our relationships with our fathers, our dads. Each of them has a different relationship and that we have to, we have to process it as children. My dad, Adrian Martin, graduated from the University of Oregon and enlisted in the United States Army during World War II. He would serve in the Philippines during the war as a tech sergeant, typing orders for the movement of troops across the Pacific Basin. He would then go to serve for eight years in Japan, instituting the Marshall Plan. And he would see firsthand the results of war. And he became a pacifist. And he would look back on his life and say, I made it through World War II. I served my God, I served my country, and I never had to carry 
a gun. And this was super important to him. And I was always fascinated to hear my dad's convictions. Now, he died in 1996, but his voice and his convictions still reign with me, right, as our parents do with us. And I always wanted to understand, how did my dad arrive at this stance? For you see, he would not only be a Presbyterian minister serving churches in Tacoma and in, then in Colorado, he would spend his career as a civil servant educating soldiers at Fort Lewis helping them to get a GED or a college education. He believed that we needed the smartest people in the military. He believed that the military was a force for keeping peace in the world. And he would say that he was always seeking to follow Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Chauncey, you've shared about your dad mm -hmm. who experienced war and then dedicated his career to being a police officer, officer and then a social worker. Yeah. We do talk yeah, a little course. bit about that. Yeah, so my, my, my dad, uh, Frank Robert Handy, who died a couple years ago, he uh, was joined the, the Navy in, at the beginning of the Vietnam War uh, when he was 17. And then they kept him on a military base until he turned 18 and then sent him uh, to the war. Uh, he was initially stationed on a destroyer, but then he got seasick, and so he was transferred to, to, uh, to Da Nang, to the front. Uh, and then he served as a river patrol gunner on uh, what's called a PBR, not the beer, but rather a boat, um, uh, for, for, for several years. Um, and after his time in the war, uh, he served as a police officer for 20 years, and then um, as a civil a civil servant kind of uh, social worker for 20 years after that, uh, helping in, uh, undocumented folks with their uh, rights and benefits from the state. Um, yeah, my dad joined the military because there were no other options for poor Latino folks in the Rio Grande Valley. That was, that was gonna be the choice. And it was the choice for the vast majority of uh, my aunts and uncles. I believe all of the 13 children, have, uh, but one, I believe, have served in the military. Um, and for my dad, violence was a necessary evil. It was something that you, that you chose in a way to keep yourself and your loved ones safe. Uh, but as his child, I heard those stories differently because I was threading needles that he, I don't know if he didn't want to look at it or wasn't, didn't want to think about it, but uh, the, those, those choices were forced upon him. The draft, uh, police, kind of histories of service in the, in the police force uh, in our family, um, a lack of options growing up. Uh, and in a certain sense, the kind of violence that my dad's life reflected was the violence that lives at the heart of the United States, that we, we uh, don't know how to live without a certain sorts of enacted violence, and that forces many of us to live in a posture of kind of reinscribing that violence into our lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So by the time he died, he and I firmly disagreed on the nature of the world, but uh, it was funny in that his life actually inspired me to resist violence in the way that I do. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chauncey, for yeah. sharing. Because peace is a choice and violence is a choice. And so as we pass the peace, many of us choose peace. But we must explore these narratives of Scripture. And we must contemplate our relationships with our world, with the scripture, with our fathers, our mothers, because their life experiences affect us. And I personally give great thanks for the privilege of dialoguing with you over these texts. Because of those of us that follow the Jesus way, we know we have to struggle together. And as we struggle together in a covenant faith community in this time and this place i pray that god will be glorified and we will learn how to live faithfully but we can't run no we've got to move together amen. so thank you chauncey thank you joyce to the glory of god amen 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 indeed. Friends, you're welcome to stand and sing our final hymn.
hymn of the day, which can be found on page 210 in your hymnals um, or follow the screens. Um, and bear with me as we have some, uh, some harpsichord action coming from our soundboard and the piano. Um, your grace is appreciated. I'm not sure what's going on in there, but, um, you know, every day is an adventure. you to go out in the world as people of courage that are not afraid to dive into the texts of scripture you don't agree with, that are willing to be in relationship with people you do not agree with, because the very spirit of God goes with us. Receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the face of the Lord shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the countenance of the Lord be lifted up upon you, and may the Lord grant you peace. Go in peace to serve and love the Lord. Amen. Amen.